Welcome back. This is still TV3 New Day. And as you all know, we are celebrating uh, Ghana in the month of March. And so we are discussing everything that has to do with celebrating Ghana, our rich Ghanaian culture, our food, our heritage. And discussing food, we are encouraging Ghanaians to consume made in Ghana food and uh, made in Ghana rice and every other thing that is made in Ghana. In, in, in the spirit of that, we are discussing price of food crops here in Ghana. And this discussion is premised on a research by the IEA. Now, the Institute of Economic Affairs has lamented that local food prices are still high and beyond uh, the means of many Ghanaians, especially the poor. According to the IEA, many crops are still subject to seasonality and considerable price fluctuations. The assertions of IEA are sharply in contrast uh, to claims made by the president that the agriculture has improved under his administration and that Ghana is no longer importing maize and that rice imports have reduced. Uh, Mr. Kufado also claimed that Ghana is now a net exporter of food stuff and that food prices are at their lowest for decades, but the IEA disagrees. It explains that the fact that food accounts for some 43% of the average Ghanaian's monthly spending is enough evidence that food prices are still very high. And so we are discussing that this morning. What do you make of the, uh, the conversation? Are food prices high where you are? Send us your views and comments on all our social media platforms. TV3 Ghana have been joined in studio by the CEO of the Chamber of Agribusiness Ghana, Anthony Morrison. Good morning. Very good morning. And, uh, so, do you agree with the conversation that food prices are high? Yes, I do. Um, really? We've, yes. Um, we've all seen a uh, rise in um, some basic commodities, but uh, overly there are a lot of data that actually account for uh, why food prices or the spikes in food prices. Uh, they are both local and international, but I would like to dwell mostly on the local ones. Um, you may first of all want to look at the government policy alignment, mm -hmm. okay? How government uh, policy intervention and overall policy control has influenced uh, food productivity in the country. Mm -hmm. Then again, you want to look at um, some externalities. Governments have dual responsibilities of providing uh, social intervention within the agriculture industry mm -hmm. and at the same time also providing some form of direct influences. Mm -hmm. So we've spoken about the fact that uh, we have seen very low credit going into agriculture and when you do have it, it's at a very high proportion, 27 to 30 percent, mm -hmm. compared to other sectors of um, the economy. Mm -hmm. And again, if you look at the neighboring countries, they are accessing credit at single digits. Now, another area, you've spoken about seasonality of mm -hmm. our farming system. Right. So the irrigation penetration rate in the industry mm -hmm. is 17%, mm -hmm. even lower. So you, you realize that um, in the, our, our model of farming, mm -hmm. we have the bimodal and the unimodal. Okay. So if you have the northern region, for instance, where they have the uni system of farming, mm -hmm. Uh, where majority of our food crops also comes from, mm -hmm. you expect that uh, governments over the years should make frantic efforts to invest into irrigation facilities mm -hmm. so that they could uh, produce food across uh, the year, at least two, two times in a year. Mm -hmm. But you don't normally see that. So that also accounts for it. Then again, our forex, mm -hmm. how best or how good is uh, our city doing compared to other uh, major currencies, especially mm -hmm. the euro and the dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, I've used the forex uh, is, as a major benchmark because mm -hmm. if you look at the fertilizers, we import them. Yeah, but government is giving free fertilizers. I no, mean, we've heard that. No, not free, the, not the, free, no, mm -hmm. no, not free. It's government not free. is subsidizing, subsidizing. fertilizers. Okay. So it's relatively cheaper. It is not. The subsidies doesn't make it cheaper. Subsidies does it make food or uh, fertilizers cheaper? Imp, uh, no, so that if cheaper. you're buying, you no, know, so if you're buying it at maybe ten cities, you it's at a no. So price. The, the importer is bringing it at let's say ten cities. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the importer could sell it on the market probably at the same ten cities or relatively a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. Now, what the government is saying is that okay, instead of you sending ten cities. I'll pay uh, 50%. Right. However, government doesn't pay that money upfront. Mm -hmm. So there, are, there is a long uh, period back which government pays. 
So now the importer puts a margin on it. Okay. That margin should be able to cater for the next importation when the importer is importing. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if the importer imports now mm -hmm. and payment to be done in six or ten months time, right. there'll be a lot of forex losses. Yes. And and the importer ought to put that margin on it so that the next it importation to make up, for the, for to the, make for up the so that you'll yeah. not be able to make a loss. Yes. So if you look at it and government is doing 50%, mm -hmm. it does not really make it cheaper. It doesn't make it cheaper. No. What we should be doing at the long run as a country is to go down the way the uh, petroleum industry have gone. Mm -hmm. So deregulate the, the, market. Uh, so the fertilizer import. No, yeah. no. Just deregulate it. So if Farmer A thinks that fertilizer A from fertilizer a company is mm -hmm. good for me. It's good for me. I'll buy. <coughs> I'll buy from that. Exactly. That, you yes. continue to buy as far as it it it, it provides you your drought resistance, your your yields per hectare. But you are, you are at liberty to buy from whoever. If, if I mean government is not forcing you to take the fertilizer. No, no, government government actually registers people onto the PFJ fertilizer okay. program subsidy okay. program. Mm -hmm. But if it's deregulated, mm -hmm. nobody has to go onto any program. Any program. The farmer decides that, look, oh, this so is... Also, that program restricts you as to where to get access to get your fertilizer. Exactly. Certainly. Because you want to take part in the subsidies. Okay. And, and because it comes in the compound form, the, the, the seeds, the, the, the fertilizers, and other things. Okay. So the other thing I, I, I was also going on, apart from the forex, mm -hmm. which... Uh, affects um, uh, food prices mm -hmm. is um, apart from the seeds the fertilizers the chemicals we also see that um are there are there access to food mm -hmm. from the farm gate mm -hmm. the the roads are so bad okay okay so access to mm -hmm. good roads mm -hmm. storage facilities and harvesting okay also compounds on the okay so, of so let's let's look at how that affects prices of food so that we have not been able to bridge the gap between the farm and the market centers. Well, so, so that gap is what is causing food spoilage. Yes, so the, we call it a food loss, uh, post harvest loss. Post harvest loss. losses. Exactly. How does that impact on price of food crops? Okay, because our yields per hectare is not growing that much as we expect. Mm -hmm. No, so if the farmer is able to produce, and uh, at the point of production, there are some uh, mitigating or challenges that makes him not to. Uh, increase his yields. Mm -hmm. Now, after the produce is ready, he needs to harvest. He doesn't get harvests on time. Mm -hmm. So he lost, there are some losses along okay. the line. Okay. Now, the farmer, the next season, have to replicate the same hectare, mm -hmm. okay, or probably increase the land size. He's unable to do that if he's able, to, he's, if he's not able to sell at a certain uh, price bank, a benchmark. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for him to be able to do that, he needs to put a certain margin on it mm -hmm. so that he'll be able to reproduce the same size of farm or increase his farm size. Mm -hmm. And that affects the food prices. Mm -hmm. now, now again, if you look at um, some areas, especially in the northern region, mm -hmm. you have to take tractors to, to drag uh, articulators out with uh, produce on it over a certain long distance. It, takes, it could take a day or a week mm -hmm. before such uh, vehicles the could finally yes before such vehicles can finally make it to so, the major so road. we will talk about uh solutions we'll talk about how government's planting for food and jobs uh program that is the flagship of, of of the mpp that's been running for the past three years we'll talk about how that should be able to resolve the many challenges of the farmer and you know somehow bring down the cost of food produce we'll talk about that but we were out there to to gauge the mood with regards prices of food. Uh, take a look. They agree with our section of the president that food prices have indeed dropped. Madam, uh, how are you? I'm fine. Madam, so you work here, you sell here at the food market. The president has said that food prices have reduced. Do you agree? No. Why? Oh, every day you go to market, things are expensive. And if you, they come and you say, oh, this one, this price, they say it's expensive. Though they go to a shop and buy the same prices. A bag of cassava is now sold for 300 Ghana cities. And one finger of plantain is sold for one city. We are pleading on the government to come to our aid. Could you believe, sir? 
common cocunte, and cacocunte, and Jenny Bianca, and the Bunyadi. Then say, and name and name in Ujina Haye Cassi. Cocunte so boa iodine. The price of Kokonte has even gone up. Prices of food stuff have really gone up. I was at the Kenke house at Adabaka in Accra. I've been eating these two cities Kenke for the past one year. So it hasn't dropped from here. If it has dropped somewhere, fine. This special Kenke place is always two cities here. I, I don't go to the market. It's my wife who goes to the market. Oh, the prices vary. Other places are one city, 50 pesos. But this place is too city. But it, it depends on the quality as well. This is the place I buy my kinky and it hasn't dropped. I don't think the price of kinky has dropped. Yeah, because this place, uh, a ball of kinky, I think uh, goes for, I think, two cities. Anyone who says food prices have been reduced has not been truthful to Ghanaians. First, a 50 pesos, we say, but one CD, 150, we are two CDs, we are Joseph Armstrong, TV3, Accra. They agree with our section. So there you have it, uh, the concerns from some uh, uh, traders out there uh, saying that prices of food crops have not gone down as uh, being uh, said by or suggested by President Kufado. So I'm still here with uh, CEO of Chimbo of Agribusiness, Ghana, Anthony Morrison. So are we saying that government's flagship planting for food and jobs has not in any way had any impact on the agriculture sector? Is that what we are saying? No, not completely so. Um, it comes in, in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one having the impact on market, as in markets now having access to a lot of variety and where to access uh, source they are produced from mm -hmm. now which is a good thing which is good mm -hmm. because it brings competition mm -hmm. and uh, people are now able to evaluate and look at the various variety the one that has longer shelf life and all that mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the perishable goods right. like the tomatoes and the, li and the likes mm -hmm. now uh, what we haven't been able to see is some intervention in the importation aspect so there is one thing increasing or encouraging local productivity. There is another thing trying to discourage import. For instance, we import a lot of tomatoes from Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. To what extent has government gone to put in some trade barriers in place to mitigate or to uh, discourage the importation? We import a lot of rice. Mm -hmm. to what but, extent if we, but if we discourage the importation of tomatoes into the country, do we have the capabilities to produce enough to, you know, to feed. So, to so that would then reflect, you know, I spoke about policy control of government. Okay. So I've not uh, actually um, expanded on uh, the policy control, what it actually meant. Mm -hmm. Now, if we, we do have as a country a long-term policy, mm -hmm. let's say 10 years, 20 mm -hmm. years, 30 years, the private sector will see the, the government's uh, long-term uh, 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 vision to invest into the industry. Okay. But if you have a short-term, medium-term policies, mm -hmm. these are not enough to incentivize the private sector to put in as required or the, the kind of money that is required to boost the industry. Okay, so you're saying that if we had local content as a state policy, we should be no, able Not necessarily to, local mm -hmm. content, but mm -hmm. though I also agree with you, mm -hmm. local content policy is important right. as uh, it's been done to the petroleum and the telecommunication industry. Mm -hmm. The agriculture industry also requires a local content policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, But what I'm saying is that do not continue to emphasize on short-term policies. Short-term policies are good, but they don't necessarily uh, uh, encourage investment. Mm -hmm. Now, majority of investment that comes into the agribusiness value chain mm -hmm. is by the private sector. What encourages the private sector to make long-term uh, investment is government's own long-term policies. So, so when they know that they are cushioned, when they know that the gains are there. Or when they know that government is providing a 10 years, 15 years, 20 years long-term strategy mm -hmm. for rice productivity. Look mm -hmm. at what Nigeria did with Dangote. Mm -hmm. The vision was clear. The clarity of purpose mm -hmm. for the rice policy right. was stated. So the private sector started investing into it, knowing that, yes, this is what government wants to achieve in the 
uh, long, uh, medium to long term objective. And this is the clarity and the infrastructure that ought to be put in place. But in Ghana, we do not have that clarity of purpose mm -hmm. in most of the areas that we want to, to mitigate. Okay, and it, it does influence a whole lot, a whole lot of uh, other facets of the, the value chain. Mm -hmm. D don't forget that the value chain has some interdependency ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to um, grains and cereals, mm -hmm. it affects livestock. Right. Okay, it affects aquaculture. Mm -hmm. When it comes to um, the perishable goods, it affects everybody. So we need to be strategic as mm -hmm. to how we prioritize. Mm -hmm. And government social, uh, agricultural social intervention policies have to be direct. The recipient have to, have to feel it. Mm -hmm. If the recipient is feeling it, don't forget that we have over 57.3% of Aurora folks mm -hmm. engaged in the agriculture value chain. Mm -hmm. And in the urban areas, we're talking about 27% that are engaged in the value chain right. of value addition, consultancy, logistics, and a whole lot of things, mm -hmm. okay? So we need to be very strategic. Mm -hmm. Yes, oil and gas is doing well. Telecommunication will be doing well. Mm -hmm. But the whole engagement for every economy mm -hmm. is that if you are agriculture sufficient, you control the economy. Control. Grateful for your time this morning. Anthony Morrison is CEO of Chamber of Agribusiness Ghana. So the conversation is so long going. How do we, you know, uh, ensure that we consume what we produce? And uh, if uh, we are producing and it's so expensive and the ordinary Ghanaian cannot purchase, uh, then we are doing something wrong. And so I'm sure our government is watching and listening to us this morning. So we are eating Ghana, so make it affordable for us. There's more on New Day. Don't go away.